The UK has been facing massive storms in the last few weeks, causing floods in multiple places across the country. Campaigners are sure it's because of climate change. The government says it's because of climate change. But are they right? Well, let's find out. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. The UK has just been going through its second major storm in as many weeks. Storm Dennis. It's ramped up the misery for a lot of people with masses of rain hitting people who'd already had flooding problems with the last storm. Many thousands of people have had an absolutely bleak time of it and there's no doubt that the biggest question on their mind is the cost. The terrible disruption and the damage to their lives. And then the short-term mitigation and defences to put their area out of future harm's way so that it doesn't all happen again in a few years. Of course, for others, the storms are just the latest evidence that we're in the middle of runaway climate change. These are just a few representative examples. Flooding from Storm Dennis. Their photos of the damage that climate change has brought to parts of Wales and England. They need to be blown up and hung in the House of Commons. Climate change isn't just at our door, it's in our living rooms. Wonder how many people suffering from Storm Dennis voted for the Tories and their pathetic climate change policies. Net zero emissions by 2050 is a pitiful target. Reap what you sow. If Storm Dennis is anything to go by, then climate change should now have zero deniers. So a lot of people seem to believe that it is utterly beyond doubt that Storm Dennis has been caused by climate change. And the responsible people in the government and its agencies seem to agree. The new Environment Secretary, George Eustace, said in an interview with LBC that the scale of flooding is due to the nature of climate change. And the Chief Executive of the Environment Agency, Sir James Bevan, specifically blamed the climate emergency for the storms. However, none of those were actual climate scientists or meteorologists. And given their due for a change, the mainstream media mostly turned to the actual scientists for their own take on the question. As a result, none of them declared that Storm Dennis was specifically the product of climate change. For instance, Channel 4 on its website quoted Dr Michael Byrne, lecturer in climate science at the University of St Andrews, who said this. These storms are nothing new going back a hundred years, but because we are now more than one degree C warmer as a whole versus pre-industrial times, every degree means 7% more water in the atmosphere and more rain in these heavy rain events. When they come, they bring more rain, 100% for certain, because of climate change. And that's a reasonable proposition that most people can get the principle of. More heat means more moisture in the air, so when a rainstorm takes place, it's more likely to discharge more rain, apparently 7% more. It's worth noting that there are a few, but relatively few, places that have suffered catastrophic flooding where the difference of 7% of rainfall would have made the difference between flooding and not. But if this is a pattern that is set, then we have to expect that the more warming there is, the more water storms will deliver. That brings some real cost to people and may make some areas less appropriate for habitation than were previously thought. The Channel 4 article went on to say this. While there is no doubt about the underlying science, experts say there is considerable uncertainty about the precise effect of climate change on British weather. We can't say for sure how the strength of storm winds or patterns of rainfall will change. And it's hard to attribute one individual weather event like Storm Dennis directly to climate change. Historical data about flooding is also often incomplete and hard to interpret, so it's difficult to say for sure that floods have become more frequent or severe. This reflects the line that meteorologists have held about the majority of extreme weather events over the last decade. No one individual event can definitively be attributed to climate change. We can only talk about likelihood of how much more frequently such events may take place. And that then comes down to the predictive power of models an imperfect art as things currently stand. That doesn't mean there are no changes. The UK State of the Climate report suggests that there is evidence that the UK's climate is generally becoming wetter. For instance, the highest rainfall totals over a five-day period are 4% higher during the most recent decade compared to 1961 to 1990, and the amount of rain from extremely wet days has increased by 17%. But that's not the same as linking specific events. 
This lack of confidence is backed up by the recent IPCC reports, which on floods specifically say that there's limited evidence that man-made climate change has made floods more common or more extreme. A part of that uncertainty is that there's a big difference between rainstorms and floods. Now you might think it's straightforward, the former causes the latter, but whether heavy rainfall turns into floods is a question that can be influenced by human activity. Well-constructed flood defences and drainage and river management and all sorts of things can help to avoid floods. Poorly thought out development, deforestation and other environmental changes can make floods more likely. In the same way that I've said numerous times in these videos that I don't really hold wildfires to be a good proxy for climate change because people can make a difference, so it is also the case for floods. Which is actually good news for those at risk because ultimately these are mitigation measures we can often take that don't involve having to persuade China and India not to build new coal-fired power stations. The uncertainty doesn't just come on floods. The latest UK State of the Climate report says that there are no compelling trends in wind storms, an additional factor of the recent UK storms, when considering maximum gust speeds over the last four decades. Indeed, even though there was an all-time record number of storms over the British Isles in the winter of 2013-2014, these also could not be linked to global warming. This inability to establish whether specific extreme events have been directly caused by climate change isn't seen as wholly satisfactory, as you can imagine. And over the last decade, scientists have been working on methods to try to gain greater certainty on these sorts of questions. For instance, the UK Met Office has a climate monitoring and attribution team, which focuses on climate change attribution. Attribution studies try to identify the fingerprints of change due to human influence on climate in observed records such as temperature and rainfall. This means isolating these fingerprints from known natural factors like changing output from the sun and climate events like the El Nino Southern Oscillation. To do this, they aim to compare what actually happened with weather events in recent history with what might have happened in a world without anthropogenic climate change. The only way you can do that is to use a climate model to simulate the conditions we would have experienced in the absence of climate change. Now, this is difficult. I mean, you may think that climate modelling in general is difficult when you're trying to identify global trends in climate change. And of course, you'd be right about that. But when it comes down to going beyond long term, bigger picture issues where you're dealing with probabilities of things happening and you zoom in to specific climate events, then the range of variables you have to deal with simply multiply. For an example of this, you only have to go back to one of the most notorious weather events in British history in the 20th century, the 1987 storm. But just the day before, one BBC weather forecaster was dismissing rumours of it being on the horizon. Good afternoon to you. Earlier on today, apparently a woman rang the BBC and said she heard that there was a hurricane on the way. Well, if you're watching, don't worry, there isn't. That storm was the worst in 300 years. It left a huge trail of destruction, but the forecasters didn't see it coming because the weather maps the day before it happened didn't show anything remotely like it. And that simply comes down to the role of chaos in creating local weather events. They sometimes explain the concept by suggesting that a butterfly flapping its wings in Japan would create a hurricane in the Philippines or wherever. It's actually pretty unlikely, but it illustrates the point that there are vast, almost incalculable variables. In a 2016 lecture, Dr Tim Palmer, Royal Society Research Professor at the University of Oxford, talked about how meteorologists have sought to get to grips with the problem since. To answer that question, I want to come back to the October storm um, and describe how we deal with situations like this today in a modern uh, weather forecasting center such as the Canadian Meteorological Service. So this is what would go on uh, in the Canadian Meteorological Service every day. And instead of running a single forecast, what we do these days is run what's called an ensemble of forecasts. We run 50 or maybe 100 forecasts with models varying for a weather forecast, principally varying the initial conditions very, very slightly. And on many occasions, um, the atmosphere actually isn't that chaotic and the hundred forecasts will actually agree with each other pretty well. And then the forecaster can go on the TV and express some reasonable amount of confidence in what's going to happen. But on this occasion, when we applied this technique uh, retrospectively to the October 87 storm, and just, we're just looking two days ahead, 
It shows this phenomenal um, divergence in solutions. It illustrates how unbelievably chaotic the atmosphere was on that particular occasion. Now, what you can do is you can count up the number of, uh, of these individual forecasts which had hurricane force winds tracking across the southern UK. It turns out it's roughly 30%. So in a modern day, if a modern, in a, you know, in a modern day numerical forecasting office, if a situation like the October 87 storm happened again, what they would be able to say, they would, they would still not be sure that it would happen, but they would be able to say there is a risk, there is a quantifiable risk of around 30% that we will see these types of hurricanes. It makes the uncertainty of a prediction more visible. Now, of course, what we really want to do is decrease the uncertainty. And if you notice the recent story about the UK Met Office spending £1.2 billion on a computer, that's the sort of processing power that will be needed to make the models anything like granular enough to start to model local weather patterns more precisely. In the light of all that, you would imagine that having a model say for certain whether or not a specific weather incident would have happened without climate change would be a tricky proposition. Nevertheless, the scientists involved believe that up to a point, some events stand out as being more able to be attributed. According to Dr. Peter Stott, the head of the Met Office attribution team, attribution studies have shown that climate change made the extreme high temperatures seen in Europe in 2003, which brought thousands of heat-related deaths, significantly more likely. And the record Australian temperatures in 2013 have likewise become much more likely. On the other side, the run of wet summers in the UK from 2007 to 2012 were shown to be associated with naturally driven variations in temperatures in the North Atlantic Ocean. And unsurprisingly, given our discussion just now, the same applies to the wet and stormy incidents. Stott said of the 2013-2014 UK storms, the current exceptionally wet and stormy British weather provides a particularly challenging test case for attribution science. A disturbed and stronger than usual jet stream has brought a sequence of intense storms on a more southerly track than usual. So where does this leave us? My summary would be this. There are some people, campaigners generally, whose habit is to point to every single extreme weather event with the absolute self-assuredness that is pretty much solely caused by climate change. Often this is done to maintain a sense of urgency in a credulous wider population and you can sometimes see that it puts a number of individuals into a state of extended panic, particularly young people. By and large, the data for current weather patterns rarely support that sort of attribution with the certainty that those people pretend. Likewise, it's convenient for politicians, even conservative ones apparently, to blame on climate change what should properly be addressed at the level of local policy and preparedness. Even if the climate wasn't promising more rainfall per storm, we've seen enough major floods in the country through the recent ages not to take it seriously how we defend existing communities and where we decide to build new communities. It doesn't mean that it makes it possible to support every single existing community where there are particularly difficult local circumstances. But the time to have that conversation is before the storm arrives. And sometimes those conversations are going to lead to difficulties and people facing up to hard truths and people spending money and all sorts of stuff. And finally, I'm happy the work is being done to try to understand how we can better attribute certain events to climate change or not. I think looking at it that way probably gives us another angle that helps us to understand complex weather systems better. I don't believe that the evidence suggests that the state of that particular art has reached the point, or even promises soon to reach the point, where commentators and decision makers should be taking as true any unequivocal statements about causation, particularly on rain and floods. The fact that the campaigners and the media would probably passionately want to be able to do this is all the more reason to be wary. It'd be easier to do this, I suppose, if there weren't people jumping on any elements of uncertainty with glee, arguing that because there's some uncertainty about that particular detail, that must mean that all computer models are rubbish and we shouldn't be doing anything about climate change at all. Such interventions don't make objective fact-led science any easier. But the right approach is to ignore the campaigners with their desire to prove causation and ignore the critics who are looking for any reason to dismiss the whole enterprise and just focus in on what evidence is actually needed and what degree of proof it realistically provides. 
It's a process that probably excites and satisfies no one, but it's a way to get at the truth, and that's what we want. Isn't it?